Okay, everybody, welcome back to Cannot Cannot. Today, I have my favorite technical analyst, literally the only one that I subscribe and read religiously every week. His name is Michael Oliver. Michael, thanks for being here. I really Thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah, so Michael, for some of those who are watching who may or may not know your background, like, could you give us a quick rundown on your who you are and what it is you do at MSA? Well, MSA got started in 1992. I've been in the future side of the business uh, when gold was legalized in 1975, I joined EF Hutton in their commodity headquarters in New York City. Uh, at that time, Hutton was the second biggest commodity broker in the world. And the head of Hutton's commodity division was also the chairman of the COMEX. So where, you know, gold and silver traded and copper. And at that time, it was uh, a few blocks from the New York Stock Exchange. It wasn't in the World Trade Center where it later moved. And I used to wander over there every now and then because the Hutton headquarters was only a few blocks away. Never traded in the pits. I wasn't registered for that, but I, I used to hang around the pits and it was fun. I learned a lot because I, I had no knowledge of it before. My background was political philosophy, <laughs> how I got into the futures business. Well, <laughs> anyway, uh, so but in over the next five, 10, 15 years, I developed um, I was first taught by David Johnston, the head of the Hutton rudimentary technical analysis. You know, the kind of stuff you see in chart books, you know, the bar charts of price and so forth. And I adapted over time away from only referencing price. And there's a there's a it's a major reason for that. It's not just because everybody else is doing it and therefore that sort of pollutes it as a as a means of analysis. You know, when everybody does something, quite often it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. uh, price is a reflection of a commodity or an asset measured versus what? A very rubbery fiat currency. Mm -hmm. And almost any fiat currency you name is very elastic and expansive over time. Uh, the quantity of the money units of yen or euros or dollars expands explosively over time. You know, like in the US, for example, since 1959, the money supply has almost doubled every 10 years. So if you have that many pieces of paper chasing a loaf of bread, it's no surprise that when I was a kid, a loaf of bread might have been 19 cents. And now it's, you know, three, four dollars. OK, it's not because there's a shortage of wheat. It's because there's, there's a vast quantity of money, paper money, yeah. chasing it. So when you measure price, measure something versus in price terms, you're measuring versus an elastic unit of measure. It's like you know, in human life, everything we do is usually done by measurement, mm -hmm. you know, relative measurement or precise measurement like temperature or light waves or all or density of, of metal or et cetera, a yardstick, for example. Can you imagine if you're building a house and it takes you six months, let's say, to build it? And you use a yardstick and that yardstick grows every month by an inch or so, but it doesn't change the number on the yardstick. It still says I'm 36 inches long. Well, obviously over six months of building, you will have made massive distortions in measurement. Yep. And so the stability of your building is in question. Okay, well, that's true with price. Because if you measure something today versus yesterday, okay. Money supply growth won't have impacted that much. But year over year or five years apart, an asset versus the same asset, the price might be higher, but is it really higher? Or simply the number of money units distorted the price. So how do you get away from that? You can't really totally get away from it. So what we do is we measure things via momentum of the asset measured in price. So the price element is still there. But we plot, let's say, the daily range of the S&P instead of in its price value, we plot it in relation to various means, let's say a 10-day moving average or a 100-day average or 200-day or, or a three-year average, et cetera. And that way, the changes in the moving average or the mean are determined not so much by the money unit, but by the actions of the underlying asset. So to some extent, you've halfway stepped away from using simple dollars versus the asset. 
if you okay. distance yourself from it. So that's the core reason that we do momentum analysis and specifically momentum structural analysis. Right. So how does this differ from, you know, uh, because you're trying to take into account the, the fluctuations of the currency, how does this differ from inflation adjusted prices compared to using momentum? Because inflation adjusted usually means the government sets up the standard of judging what's inflation adjusted. And oh. they're, the same, they're the same people who destroy the unit of measure, the, the money yep. unit. So why am I going to trust their quote, their, their unit of measure of what the change in the, the quant, you know, et cetera. Even, even the Federal Reserve has recently discontinued the use of, yeah. you know, I mean, so they don't want us to see you know, the underlying metrics. And, and things like CPI and stuff like that are so biased in the way they're constructed and so unreality based that mm -hmm. I don't even pay attention to them. Uh, you know, the other day we just had a CPI number and it was a dramatic thing. And of course, you know, it's measured all kinds of ways, like, you know, how much was it up but versus last year? Well, last year we were in a big hole. So naturally yeah. it would be up a lot versus last year. I'm more concerned with uh, the reality of the money unit expansions, which we now don't see with them too anymore. But, you know, we know money supply in the U.S. has gone off the pitch. Yeah. You know, not just doubling every decade. We're now probably doubling every year at the rate we're going, you know, if we continue. And they'll find reasons to continue. It's not just the virus. Um, and, you know, I can give you an example in a little bit, but uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kenneth. What, what else can I answer for you? So wh why did you choose to do, I know you're mainly technic all technical analysis, So, but you have your own fundamental views as well, right? So yes. why do you choose specifically to listen only to the technical and disregard any fundamental analysis if your technical uh, charts don't support it? I look at, I, I focus on the charts. That's what does it. You know, so I, I do have a background. I'm, I'm a libertarian. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons I did not continue political philosophy into academia because I would never have gotten a job back in the 1970s. Okay. Right. I, I was not liberal. I was not conservative. I was libertarian. And I've even written a book on it, uh, merging the thoughts of Ayn Rand with Dr. Murray Rothbard. And, uh, Anyway, so I, but that's got to stay in the background. Hmm. Fortunately, many times, especially the major trends that we measure, and we tend to focus more on what you would call long term. We don't yep. we don't offer day trading type technical analysis. If you want that, go elsewhere. We look at stuff that is likely to last, you know, at least several months at minimum, preferably quarters for several years. So we're looking at the bigger picture of all the markets we analyze. And we analyze all four categories, it would be stocks, debt market, foreign exchange, and commodities. Now, obviously, for example, we had a big bull market in gold from 2000 yeah. up to 2011. Yeah. And that fit with uh, you know, a libertarian view, you know, you're positive on gold because it's real money. The government's mm -hmm. can't distort its quantity. It tends to hold its value over time. Yes, it oscillates just like any other asset, but it tends to hold its value over time. But in 2011, at 1900, as soon as it backed off from that high by, oh, about $100 or so into early 2012, we turned major bearish. Now, it's not like the fundamentals had suddenly changed. I mean, governments were still printing money, et cetera. We had uh, monetary expansion. So why didn't I stay bullish? Well, annual momentum of gold, as we measured it, and that was to measure monthly prices in their relationship to a 36-month average, which is a smooth three-year average. If you looked at the price chart, it was just, it was ballistic. You could hardly even draw a trend line. But if you right. looked at the annual momentum chart, it was a beautiful staircasing, multiple hits along an angle where you know, a blind man could have seen it. You had seven precise hits on a trend line that went back about three years. So there was a structure there to break. It was if you knew if it broke that line, something was wrong. Well, it broke that line only a few months off the high. And it spent the next year and a half to all of 2012 and into early 13, flip-flopping around, not making new highs, but just holding itself together. And we still remain bearish. And most gold bulls were still bullish. And yet we set our side, our fundamental view of gold long term as a place to be, place to hold assets. 
and we went negative. We stayed negative until 2016. Gold yeah. it made it slow in 15 and turned up. So we again, when did we turn bullish? It wasn't because the fundamental has drastically changed. They've since changed for sure. But the gold bottom came in before fundamentals changed. It just was over underpriced. It made a low. We could see it on momentum. Very clear base was built, not price, but on momentum. And in February of 2016, as price moved up to 1140, we turned long-term bullish again. And we remain long-term bullish. Based again on momentum trend structures, not because we hold gold at high esteem. Okay, so you're, you're asset agnostic. You're just basing everything on what you read from the charts, right? Correct, correct. Okay, so recently I, I watched some of your other interviews and you made a call for $8,000 gold and $200 silver in the next, was it 24 months? Yep, a couple of years, wouldn't surprise me. So how, how did you come to this conclusion? Like, do the charts uh, show a projection of, of that price? Well, yes, to some extent they do. In fact, I was, you can refer to price, simplicity of price. In the case of gold, let's go back to like 1970, uh, before it was futures market. It became futures yep. market in January of 1975. But there was a bull market going on in the London bullion market. And basically, gold went up seven to eightfold during that five year period. It peaked 200 bucks when it began trading in New York in the COMEX in January of 75, but it had an eightfold move. Okay. Then uh, you had a bear market cut it price in half. That, down to $103 and 50 cents in the summer of 1976. And by 1980, you'd gone where? Yeah, about 850 bucks, eight full move. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you look back at the bull markets in gold over, over the last 40, 50 years, they've all been about eight full moves. Mm. Okay, where was the last bear market low? 1,050 area. Okay. okay, so when you say gold could go to eight thousand, you're not saying anything more extravagant than what happened in the thri uh, prior three bull markets in gold the last 40, 50 years. Went up eightfold. Uh, now we're in different times now, so I admit that even that eight thousand may just be a routine, another typical gold bull market, and it wouldn't surprise me it goes way beyond it. Okay, uh, gold is not on its own here. You know, there, we've got a crisis. Uh, of major proportions has been building in asset categories over the past decade plus that has created price distortions, false investments, false notions. And when they come unwound, when, when the error is exposed, sometimes the reversion to correct the error is even more dramatic than the error itself. Okay. And it wouldn't shock me that certain things go down more than they probably are justified to do, and some things will go up more than justified. Markets often overshoot, right? Yep. Well, let's talk about the silver question, $200. Well, silver is definitely very much restrained to gold. Right now, it's outperforming again. In other words, over the last year or so, it's been an outperformer to gold. So it's been better to own silver uh, the last year and a half than it has been to own gold. And it's likely to continue that way for the next couple of years. But why 200 bucks on silver? Well, it's more or less a, a logarithmic scaled measure where we look at the prior peaks. There were two peaks, 1980 and then 2011, that were either side of 50 bucks. Yeah. And in between, we were down to as low as, you know, recently as $11. And after the first time to 50, we went down to, I think, about $5. Uh, but when we look at a logarithmic scale of silver, it looks like not only should one go up to challenge the two prior highs, but take them out and probably go as much or a log scale beyond that as they've been living below that dual peak. Mm. And uh, yeah. that would put silver more in line with gold. In other words, it would catch silver up to what gold has done. Gold hasn't hit multiple highs in a flat level. It's made higher highs each time. Silver hasn't. And I think silver is about to unleash in a way that not only takes out the dual highs, gives you a triple top breakout yeah, above 50, but catches up to gold on a long term basis. And uh, as long as we see one gold in an uptrend, which is not being threatened whatsoever by this protracted pullback, and two, silver on a spread basis continue to outperform gold, which it's doing, we'll continue to hold with the idea that one, Gold's probably going to 8,000 minimum. 
and uh, silver is going to catch up to it historically. And uh, I think there's some other folks have come up with numbers like that, even higher than 200. And uh, yeah. I could be understating the case. So what kind of world is an $8,000 gold price like? <laughs> it, I, is, is that actually still just preserving your purchasing power or are you actually profiting when, when the gold price goes that high? Yeah, it's, it's a little of both. I mean, markets, again, markets tend to swing in excess. We know that. Mm-hmm. You know, stock markets frequently go way beyond their reality. We're there now. Okay. And also when they collapse, they go way beyond their reality. Yeah. Like, an, so we collapsed from 1570 in, in 2007 high down to 667 uh, in uh, March of uh, 2009. We probably overshot the downside. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe, maybe reasonable for it to go gone from 1500 down to, you know, 800 or something. We're down to 600. Okay. So markets tend to, as they get into a trend and mature in that trend, the emotion tends to build. Late comers in the market join. You know, yep. The people who didn't buy at the opportune time suddenly say, God, I got to have some of that. You know, like the Bitcoin buyers right now, for example. And, and we've seen this at Gold Peaks too, you know. Where you know the guys who didn't own gold at the right price uh, suddenly join in late, and they, they pay for that. And so it, it's not just a fundamental reason that certain markets are mispriced historically due to changes in the money unit, for example, but also in relation to each other. Uh, gold, for example, uh, during the 2000 to 2011 period, everybody looks back and says, "Gee, boy, stock market went up a lot." The U.S. stock market. You compare it to gold, no, it didn't. Gold beat the pants off the U.S. stock market, even though the stock market was soaring. Mm. Gold beat it on a relative basis. That all changed between 2011 and 16. Gold gave it back, stocks kept going up. So there's an inhale and an exhale, and quite often it gets excessive on either end. And that would not be surprising this time. Okay. So if gold goes up to... $8,000. Eight thousand dollars. How how does this compare to the nineteen eighties gold rush when um, gold went from one hundred to eight hundred and fifty? Yeah. How does that? How does this compare? Is it going to be another round of like super serious inflation? And Paul Volcker had to bring up the rates to twenty percent just to curb it. I we've argued that it's going to be reflective to some extent of the late nineteen seventies bull market in gold. Okay. That was a period of stagflation worldwide. In other words, the world economy was anemic. It had come out of a recession. Stock market had made a deep bear market low in 1974, uh, a huge multi-year correction, probably got too low. It rallied into 1977, talking to the S&P now, and then it went sideways through 1982. So stock market was a wasteland for five or six years there, where, no, it didn't collapse anymore. It had already collapsed in 1974, but it didn't go up again. So it was a horrible place to have your money because you weren't making any money in a period of inflation. So yeah. the stock market was not keeping up with the price of bread or the price of cow manure. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't keeping up with anything. It was a wasteland. Gold soared. Commodities also soared at the same time. Mm. Well, what's the current situation? Very similar in, the, in this regard. One, it's a bit different for the stock market because we haven't just had a big bear market where you've cut stocks in half. Yeah, we yeah. had a sharp drop last year, but we came back yeah. quick and made new highs. Okay. So we've got a stock market that really has been an uptrend for a dozen years. Now, that's a long time for the U.S. stock market to be in a vertical move. And especially when you look at the NASDAQ 100, it has gone vertical last summer in a blow-off type move, meaning while the S&P made new highs, the NASDAQ 100 made the vertical highs on a greater percentage basis, what we could call term a blow-off. Now, over the last handful of months, the NASDAQ 100, the leadership, the weighted leadership of the stock market, that's Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Google, they're all very heavily weighted in NASDAQ 100. They constitute 50% of the index. Uh, And even in the S&P, they constitute like 20 some odd percent. So they're the front end leaders of the market. They ceased to go up several months ago. Now they're trying to nip a new high right now, but really what's happened over the last three or four months is the NASDAQ 100 S&P spread has collapsed 
In other words, the leadership, though in price it hasn't collapsed, it is left behind by the S&P continuing to rise. The NASDAQ spread versus S&P has broken all kinds of stuff, which tells us that your leadership is now wounded. Even though the price charts don't reveal it yet, the spread does. Now, the difference between now and the 70s was stocks had had a big bear market in 74. Yeah. So at, during that period of commodity inflation, stocks did not collapse. They just went sideways. It could be different this time because we've had a dozen years of upside in the stock market determined by the Dow, S&P, or the NASDAQ 100. So if they turn down, they could actually not just go sideways into a wasteland while money moves into very cheap commodities, which have been reborn you know, over mm-hmm. the last several quarters, and gold. But they could actually go down. And we suspect you're going to have a down, especially in the U.S. stock market which is the most exaggerated one in the developed economies. Uh, Japan is not as exaggerated. Uh, Europe certainly is not. Heck, Europe is barely above the 2015 highs. You know? So we've got the most exaggerated stock market. So not only could we get the 70s type commodity move, but we could actually get down in the stock market, which would do what? Well, a couple things, and this is something that's not being talked about a lot right now. One, it could encourage more money flow into commodities because investors say, hey, you know, this is starting to hurt and I'm doubtful of this thing sustaining because it's been 12 years of verticality and everybody and their brothers now in the market. OK, yeah, it's a little uncomfortable feeling. So I'm going to move some more. I'm going to move my assets over to the cheap stuff, stuff that can't go to zero commodities mm-hmm. and uh, commodity related stocks like beat up energy stocks or agricultural related stocks. They've been soaring lately, very strong percentage gains from deep, deep levels. So the other thing a stock market wobble could do, and it's not a variable right now because the Fed has been concerned about other things. The stock market has not been a problem for the Fed over the last six, nine months because stock market's been going up nicely. What if the stock market starts to break? Any concern that you think they might have about monetary expansion will go out the window fully if the stock market becomes a negative major variable because they won't be looking at the price of bread anymore or CPI. They're going to be looking at that asset category that they want to defend. And so realizing that, one, you've got a weakened stock market. We're expecting a high soon, by the way. We're focusing in on it. If that starts to unfold, there's going to be a more rapid, obvious asset shift, investor preference shift from into commodities okay. and out of stocks. But if there's, like, if there's this liquidity crisis or you know, where it hits the top and people start selling off, wouldn't that affect gold as well in a liquidity event? Well, uh, don't think so. One, you just had a major bear market in gold that took gold from 1900 down to 1,050, okay? So a okay. 45 percent drop. Okay, now it had a base that was wide about seven, six, seven years wide, even on a price chart, you could see it. Where yeah. every time you go up into the mid 1300s, they knock it back down. They never go back to take out that low they made in December 2015, but they go back down to the low 1100s. And even in 2018, gold was back down to 1160. Mm. Only 100 bucks off its bare low three years after the bear low. So gold really hasn't been a bull market that long. It only recently, a year and a half or so ago, broke out of that price base. Silver, in contrast, only broke out of its price base and annual momentum base, by the way. When it came up through $19.48, that was our trigger number in July of last year. At that point, we said silver is likely to go up to about 30 bucks in the first surge. That's exactly where it went. Since then, yeah. it's gone into a very tight range. Actually, if you look at weekly closes of silver, it's been from below 28 on the upside. And generally, the extreme low is about 22. So it's been in a 5 or $6 range. And right now, we're in the upper half of that range. Yeah. And this is freshly after silver broke out of a seven-year wide base. Why should it make a surge and then top? Mm-hmm. Give it some time. It's a massive price base. In fact, it's one of the biggest bases silver's ever created. Also is true with gold. So expect some sustainability time-wise. Uh, and also, I think before gold ever ends, you're going to see something we haven't seen yet out of gold. We've seen it out of silver. 
where his post breakout surge was 50% gain in three weeks. Yeah. Went from the 19s to 29. Okay. Three weeks of July and August of 2020. Gold's advance has not been explosive. It's been layered. It's not been irrational. It's not been emotional. Whereas it, it, it did it a couple hundred dollar moves and then would pull back and then a couple hundred dollar move and then pull back over spans of time. You're going to see a point in the gold move where you move 500 to 1,000 bucks rapidly at some point in time here. And I suspect it's going to occur. We might have to fight our way back up to about 1,900, but you get much into the 1,900s again, and that's still below the high. It was yeah. 2070 in the summer. You get up in the mid-1900s, I think you could see gold go electric, where suddenly you get a price move out of gold that just opens your jaw, and it just takes a quantum leap beyond this ink of the last, you know, we're barely, we're, we're below the 2011 high right now, yeah. by hundred bucks or so, you know, but so it's, it's not exaggerated. Gold is, is, is just begun. And uh, we expect its tenor and tone to change. And I suspect that's coming when we start to come out of this congestive pullback process we've seen for the last now going on nine months uh, where gold's given up. Well, I think we're only about 14% off the high or something like that, 15 off the high. It's not a big deal given it's taken nine months to give back a small double digit percent. So once this correction ends, <clears throat> expect gold to get uh, far more volatile and probably spook the folks who dump their positions. Okay. Because they won't know what to do. You know, do I get back in? Oh my God, why did I get out? You know, okay. <laughs> Yeah. So how, how exactly do you deal with the emotional side of um, investing? Because gold has been in correction for like eight months now. And, yeah. you know, you see all the other asset classes, you see Bitcoin, you see stocks, everything's going up and then gold's just sitting there. So how do you deal with these kind of emotions? Because this is I, really I, long. It's because I've come to this conclusion. We've said it in recent reports. Gold is not a follower. It's a leader. Don't expect okay. it to follow some headline. For instance, uh, gold moved from the 11, uh, uh, 1050 low in, in 2015 up to a new high, 2070. And all during that time, if you'll look at the dollar index chart, for example, it's been stuck in a range from like 103 high to a low about 89, 88, 89. Since 2000, Late 2014, it's been stuck in this range going up and down, had zero correlation to price trends in gold. In fact, if you go back and look last summer, the dollar had gone up to 102 again in March last year. There was a crisis where there was a demand for dollars when the stock market broke. And then it started to collapse again. And last summer, it collapsed pretty sharply back to the lower end of that multi-year range. And what was gold doing there during that time? Going down also. Gold yeah. doesn't care about the things you think it cares about. Yes, it does care about, them, but it's a leader of those things. It's not the follower of those things. So it doesn't need, for instance, right now, we now have commodity price inflation, you pointed out. Yeah. So how in the world is gold going down while well, corn, wheat, soybeans, crude oil, copper, uh, cow manure are all going up explosively? Yeah. How come gold's not going with it? It knew they were going to do it. It was already ahead of the game. Now, at some point here, we're going to see those commodities, which we think are in a stall process right now. We think there could be a couple of months of this type of action where they can correct by going sideways because they had a huge percent move after all. Hmm. And you're going to see commodities get in sync behind gold as of the late 1970s, where gold will become the leader again and the commodities will be in sync with it. Uh, and we suspect you'll see that later this year when commodities resume their upside, which we think they've got, again, they're in a redundant process right now for a couple of months. Okay. And uh, I think they'll join it. And it'll make more sense to everybody. And also the dollar starting to break down. So it wouldn't surprise me that gold responds to that. But it, it doesn't really need it. It's the leader treated yeah. as such. Okay. So if, if gold... I know, I know you believe that Bitcoin will ultimately be outlawed or regulated heavily. If gold or silver goes up to $8,000 or $200, will the government do something similar? Because now gold becomes a competitor in terms of the currency. Yeah. yeah. Historically, we have the example of Roosevelt. You know, yeah. a, uh, you know 
sconded with everybody's gold, gave them currency for it and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Basically, but this is a different time and place. One, the world is is united in the sense that intellectual connectivity via the internet. Okay, so it's not like we're just the U.S. now. The U.S. government can't just do what it wants. It has to coordinate it with other governments. It has to acknowledge what China might be doing, you know, and and compare its policies. Like China is now going to have a cryptocurrency. Well, you know, to some extent, that's sort of (sighs) taking over the crypto market in China. Yeah. Now the state run apparatus. Okay. Uh, Already, and we predicted this. the and we've been very accurate on calling Bitcoin. By the way, when it came out, it was first legalized and traded on the, uh, not legalized, but it was traded on the futures exchange, the CME, in December of 2017. It was at 20,000. We yep. predicted it would go to 5,000 because we thought it was a bubble. It was going to crash. It did. It went to 3,600. In fact, we got bullish as it came back up through 5,000. And basically, nothing that Bitcoin has done on long-term momentum since then has negated its bullish trend. Okay, so we're still bullish on Bitcoin, Hmm. but it's built a structure under it now in our momentum charts that suggests it better not exhale too much at any point in time now, because you break down through the mid 56,000s right now, we've got some triggers there that say, "Uh uh-oh, you're going down. Now, whether it's gonna be a a wipeout or just something serious correction, but something's gonna happen negative. While Bitcoin just made a new high, it just made a marginal new high. And so we hear the headline, Bitcoin makes new high. But if you look at even the price chart over the last several months, it's getting more incremental in terms of the new highs. And as that's occurring, the momentum structures underneath it are getting clearer, where if you drop a bit now, the numbers rise on momentum because the moving averages rise, uh, you're going to get a good correction. And there's been some people within the Bitcoin crypto world key people in there, that industry who've even now said, uh-oh, beware, there's going to be some regulation here. And why should there be? Well, uh, because if you're going to have a monopoly over money, as the Federal Reserve does or the Euro, as, uh, ECB does or a BOJ does, and you've got a private currency that doesn't have infinite expansibility, you know, you can't expand mm-hmm. Bitcoin infinitely, you can't inflate it, Okay. And it starts to compete with the statist currency. And they want to inflate the currency to create inflation to stabilize their economies. That's a supposed method. And they get a competing currency that grows and grows in terms of its acceptability and use. They got to take some action at some point to restrain the usability and viability of that currency. And they've used terms like Lagarde and... uh, Janet Yellen have both used terms yeah. in recent speeches that implied criminality. Yeah. Why would you say that if you didn't intend to crack down on those currencies? Yeah, well, that's, that's funny, right? Because I'm sure the dollar has been used in lots of crimes too. Oh, yeah. Of course it has, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so but they stated this, and to me that says, okay, that's policy intent. Now, the yeah. question is, in what way can they do it? And I'm sure they can come up with some ways. And the point is that that's a factor I don't think most Bitcoin chasers have factored in. All they see is the upticks. Mm-hmm. They don't see this dark cloud looming on the horizon. And when they start to see a headline about the, the, this Senate committee's having hearings on regulation of, of cryptos, or the Federal Reserve wants this done, or you know, uh, then suddenly you might have a, a, a prick in that bubble, and Bitcoin may you know pull back somewhat. I don't think they can ever ban it. Yeah. In the case of gold, let's get back to that issue. Can they ban it? No, not anymore. Uh, gold has is, is been around too long. It's in too many people's pockets. And it's not just in, in conservative or fiscal conservative or libertarians' pockets. It's in everybody's pockets. Yeah. Uh, asset managers who are hardly gold bucks, like Ray Dalio, for example, uh, has said good things about gold. Because he said bad things about the money supply. He says, you, yep. you people who invest in the stock market, you better be aware that your stock price is uh, being distorted by this. And he shows a chart of, you know, M2. Uh, even he recognizes that, you know, you, you need some stability. And, and that's one area you can get. And so they're not going to, 
if they ever tried to restrain gold or confiscate gold, uh, they would not have a quiet time doing it. Hmm. So I don't I think that's viable. Okay. So I want to switch over to some more short-term topics now. Uh, as you know, gold has been tracking rail rates very closely. Do you think we've seen the bottom of gold here? I think you've seen the secondary bottom. In other words, the corrective bottom. In fact, we once they made the November low, yeah. it was uh, 1763, as I recall. And then you rallied. And you came down and you took out the November low. Well, our momentum work did not take out the November low. In other words, when we look at our long-term indicators and even intermediate trend indicators, they didn't make a lower low. So what that's called is a non-confirmation, meaning price said, oh, I just broke that low. And it broke it by, you know, 100 bucks, okay? mm. 1670. That was early March. Then we turned up. And at that point, when we turned up off that low in mid-March, and we retested it again late March, by the way, didn't make a new low, though. We circled the March low and said, that was probably it. Okay, so if that was it, okay, now what happens? Well, now it's an issue of struggling through certain barriers on the upside to reignite the uptrend. Yep. And we think we're, we've busted through a few of them and different time scales we look at. Uh, there's a few others left. And one that's pretty obvious, just even to a price chart folk, would be this. Look at the November low, it was in the 1760s. The rally high in March was in the 1750s. And again, this month, we've come up into the 1750s. So what we're doing is price is butting up against that November low. If you yeah. clear that November low, like get up in the 1760s and 70s, then even price chart will overcome a hurdle. And that okay. would be a plus mark. Uh, okay. Momentum factors have already done a lot of good things before price. Yeah. So what do you think will be the catalyst for this next rally in gold? Do you think the, the real rates will decline again or gold just doesn't follow real rates anymore? I don't. I'm not a big buyer of the real rate theory, but uh, right now, let's talk about T-bonds, uh, okay. long-term bonds, T-notes, T-bonds. Uh, the ETF that's popular in the U.S. is TLT, which is a 20-year-plus yep. U.S. government debt. While gold has gone down since August, so have they. The yields have risen. Price has gone down in T-bonds, T-notes, TLT. They look like a gold chart. <laughs> and in fact... In terms of global asset managers' assessment of what is an alternative to the stock market, those are your two markets to the prime alternatives, long government debt, particularly U.S., and gold. So if you want to exit the stock market, you can go into commodities. That's acceptable to them, commodity-related, but also these two core assets that will hold their value relative to the stock market. So they rush into T-bonds and they rush into gold. And when the stock market started to recover, they started dumping out of gold and dumping out of T-bonds. Yeah. We think the T-bonds are highly technically correlated to gold right now. And that we think the T-bonds probably have also made their low in price. And all this talk and chatter about higher rates because of inflation. Yes, we think you're going to get higher rates, but we don't think you're seeing that move right now. We strongly suspect you're going to get a very sharp rally out of T-bonds, meaning another drop in rates, not yeah. to a lower level than we've seen, but you know, a sharp rally. Uh, and it will be correlated with further upturn in gold. Okay. At some point later this year, though, I suspect that that linkage between government bonds and gold, which has been in sync yeah. for the last, let's say, year, will dissipate. And we'll see T-bonds again go back down to reflect genuine concern about inflation and gold will divorce from t-bonds at that point but for now they're okay. still in sync okay so you, you mentioned um you don't believe in the real rate things what are some of the common misconceptions between you know the gold price and other asset classes like the dollar crude oil or general equities uh, can you clear that up for some people who would think like just because the dollar drops gold has to go up or other core relationships like that? Well, I think right now the dollar dropping would be, in fact, uh, be positive for gold. And I think the next drop of the dollar would be fairly dramatic. Okay. Uh, because we've been stuck in, we had a sharp drop in uh, 2018, dropped to a low in early 2018 from 103.50, it dropped down to 88 something dollar index. And anyway, sideways for a couple of years. Okay. Mm. And during that time, 
while the dollar confused people, gold actually went up. So it didn't need the dollar. But I think gold is assuming the dollar is going to break more. And the dollar right now, as far as we're concerned, is probably in process of doing that, that the current okay. decline of the dollar should be taken seriously. And it probably will become wind at the back of gold. But don't count on it being day to day, week to week type stuff. You know, it's a big picture wind and it doesn't have to correlate week to week. Uh, there might be times when it looks like it does, but it, that's not the important thing. And again, treat gold as a leader, not a follower of these events. It anticipates dollar weakness. It anticipates a stock market weakness and an asset class movement, therefore out of stocks into something else. So that, that's my suggestion. Okay. So your impression of gold is that it's a leading indicator. It's anticipating what is happening in the other asset classes. So what, what exactly drives gold? How does it anticipate what's going to happen? Or is it more of a supply demand imbalance because there's not enough miners going up to mine the gold or that's one factor. Yeah. 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 So, so what are the strongest drivers of, of gold? Everything we've been talking about, uh, but primarily I would say the continued dilution expansion and money supply across the world, particularly the the economy. So in other words, the continued degradation of money units, uh, it doesn't create a straight trend in gold, but it creates a constant yeah. zigzag trend. And the money degradation is increased. It's going to continue to increase. In particular, we argue it'll increase if the stock market starts to become a threat. Uh, and, and the central banks say, oh, no, we got to defend the stock market. They're even going to go more crazy, yeah. in which case that's even more infusion of more money units chasing to try to hold the stock market. up. Even Bernanke wrote a paper on this. Uh, before he became head of the Fed, I think it was in 2009, he wrote a paper where he said Fed shouldn't just be interested in interest rates and stuff like that. They should be concerned about supporting the stock market. And he explained why. He said because psychologically it creates consumer demand and consumer happiness. And the more we don't want people to save money, he almost explicitly said that. We want them to spend because that makes things better. Mm-hmm. Well, you know. By denigrating savings, which is what they've done over the last 10, 12 years, it creates a situation when you have a virus and people get laid off, they don't have any savings. Or their savings is one-tenth of what their father used to have. And so, you know, by not having savings, yeah, the the party was fun when it was going on, but now suddenly you'd like to have some sit back to some safety savings and you're, you're low levels. Why? Because you've been spending as the Fed wanted you to do. Well, they're going to go back to defending the stock market once it gets into trouble again, and it'll be a totally new factor in their playbook. So right now, it's not. So what do you think needs to happen before gold starts to rally again? I think gold will start running again without anything happening. And it'll anticipate, you know, for instance, if the stock market even just starts to wobble, I think okay. right now the T-bonds, again, treating T-bonds as a safe haven for asset managers uh, who aren't gold bugs. Most global asset managers are not gold bugs, but they do shift from category to category. You know, they rebalance their portfolios, not just mm-hmm. different stocks, but different asset categories. And if you start shaking the stock markets again, I don't mean a crash. I just mean start taking them down in layers. Most, most bear markets don't begin with crashes, by the way. All right. 29 did, but that's an exception. Uh, but you start shaking that stock market, you're going to get asset class shift. It'll be subtle. This asset manager doing it more, this guy doing more. And they're going into those two asset categories. So I think they're both going to be, watch the T-bonds, because the T-bonds start to roar up out of here. You can bet gold's going to be roaring up out of here, too. And I think it's partly going to be a function of a sense of wobbliness in the stock market. Okay. You know, asset managers have been around a long time. No, this is an old, old bull market stocks, and it's yeah. very high. And on valuation basis, you know, they're a little doubtful. And all it's going to take is a little push, and they're going to start more asset class shift. Okay, cool. Thanks, Michael. Uh, now, I want to get into the, the part that I'm really interested in, which is entrepreneurship, because I'm an entrepreneur too. Uh, could you tell us your entrepreneurial story? Like, how did you 
come to develop your own unique methodology and what made you decide to set up you know your own uh, business well in 1987 uh, using momentum of the s p 500 i anticipated a collapse in the market now i didn't know it'd be a big bear market or what but it was a collapse coming and it turned out yep. to be a crash and i could see it because uh the price chart looked great I mean, you could draw all kinds of trend lines on the S&P and you could never draw many of them because it's sort of an upward curve. You know, you, you couldn't draw a four point uptrend line because it curved. <laughs> so right. it looked like a rocket ship. Uh, so it didn't give you any real price clues. As if you drop to here, you go break something. You know? But when I ran momentum, quarterly momentum of the S&P, and by that I mean this, I plot each monthly bar relative to above or below the current three quarter moving average. Well, that's the last three quarters average together, create a three quarter average. It's about the same as a 200 day average, if you think about the duration. And it's not breaking the average itself necessarily, because you might build structures that are above or below the average. So uh, I forget where it was in, in 87, but there was a structure on the quarterly momentum chart where every time the S&P had come down in the, from two, 1985, 86, 87, in the years prior to the 87 top, you had built a flat floor on momentum. You could not see it on the price chart. The price chart was up. But on momentum, you kept coming back to the same relative level to that changing three-quarter average. So there was a structure, like a bridge on the River Kwai. Mm -hmm. You could see it clear as a bell. And you stick a dynamite and dynamite and dynamite and blow the bridge up. you got to have something to break before a market can break. Well, it had something to break. It was a clear structure. And it broke it. And lo and behold, it was a crash. Uh, I didn't catch the whole crash because I got out too early that Monday or Tuesday morning. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, covered my shorts, but I made quite a bit percent wise. And it convinced me that, boy, I got to get into this more use of momentum, which I, right. I was plotting them by hand at that point in time. I didn't have Excel or anything like that to do it. Uh, well, over the next several years, still being a futures broker, uh, I was in North Carolina at the time. And at that time, uh, Wachovia Bank headquarters were about 30 miles from where I lived. They were in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Wachovia was a big bank then. And also one of the most solid banks in the country. Uh, the head of their trust department and their bond department, same guy, who's the vice financial vice president of Wachovia, heard about my methodology through a stockbroker that knew me, that knew him. And he invited me to come over to his office and, and to show him my charts and chit chat with him because he was interested in anything new technical. Right. Uh, you know, he was used to looking at price charts. And so I showed him and my charts were again by hand. <laughs> and I faxed him over, not, not emailed, I faxed him over by hand. And he, he liked it. We chatted for a couple of hours and he said, have you ever heard of soft dollar? And I said, no. And he said, soft dollar is a way that asset managers pay for research. The SEC allows them to use some of their commissions that are generated in managing money through a brokerage firm to be used to pay for research. Oh, okay. And so as their trust department generated commissions through a brokerage firm that they handled their trust accounts, he paid me soft dollar for my research. And again, I supplied it to him via fax machine and handwritten charts. Uh, several years later, I adapted to you know the good stuff. But anyway... So I got into the soft dollar business of providing institutional uh, asset managers with my timing work. Uh, and it grew and grew. And I, at one point, I, I acquired a, a Vanguard fund yeah. uh, that, that subscribed to my service. And, and it, 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 MSA took off at that point, 1992. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've continued since. Uh, we've since opened up MSA in 2014-15 to retail subscribers. Yeah. And, you know, our institutional subscribers used to pay quite a bit, you know, way more than what you see online when you want to subscribe to a research report, you know, tens of thousands of dollars anyway. Uh, but we opened up to retail. So we have a, a lot of uh, family offices, certified financial planner types, high net worth individuals, and we're not real cheap. We're $1,800 a year for our all asset category report, yep. which covers all four major asset categories. We usually come out with 
four or five reports a week, including a big weekend report. Uh, so what, what made you decide to open it up to the public? Well, I mean, word got around and we, I'm trying to think, oh, I know the first thing that, that got us out to the public is, uh, I won't name his name, but a, a writer for Wall Street Journal is still there, noticed our work back in 2016. And we'd forecast a sharp collapse uh, in late 2015. It happened to be in the Christmas edition of the Wall Street Journal, which came out on a weekend, meaning it was the only Wall Street Journal for a three-day period. Nice. And he had an article on us explaining the momentum structural analysis does things differently. And boom, we've got a bunch of subscribers over that. And uh, I get interviewed here and there, and you know, it's just hard to explain, but you know, finally word of mouth, and it, it started to pick up. And we acquired, uh, you know, we've got several thousand subscribers right now. Uh, and uh, a lot of them are small institutions, some large institutions, but a lot of retail subscribers. So it, it just sort of grew in a way that we couldn't really predict. Uh, and uh, so it wasn't something that I planned as such. Uh, right. We do more of that now in terms of, you know, accessibility to the public and, and interviews like with you, for example. Yeah, uh, which no well, doubt will get us some subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, how do you think you differ from other technical analysis, uh, analysts who like to promote? You know, there's some of them who like to promote themselves, and they promise you like massive gains each year, like 100 percent every year or every six months or something like that. You know, no. if if they're so good, wouldn't they just be already a, made a ton of money for themselves? They wouldn't need to to promote. Yeah, technical analysis right, like this, right? Right. right. Uh, we're different, and uh, we don't promise any results. Okay. We provide samples of reports to people; they can judge themselves. And usually, before somebody subscribes to us, they check this out anyway, uh, either by getting yeah. samples or they've got a friend, or they've heard of, or they saw an interview, and uh, you know, and, and so forth. So they put it together. And we don't promise anything. We don't provide specific trades. We give you specific numbers. Mm -hmm. And usually what we do at MSA is if we see an event shaping up, and as I said a minute ago with the bridge and the river quiet uh, vision, when you build a structure and it's clear, and I'm talking momentum structure now, not necessarily yeah. price might be you know, hard to analyze. It might be an upward curve or something. Uh, but momentum usually will develop structures that price doesn't develop. Where if you looked over my shoulder momentum chart that I'm looking at, let's say, you'd say, wow, that doesn't look like the price chart. And boy, yeah. you better not break that line because it's, you know, it's been hit four times or something. Uh, we're going we're gonna to warn you ahead of time, sometimes months ahead of time, that this thing's shaping up for a top or this market's shaping up for a bottom. So we get you psychologically oriented toward seeing that market differently than you currently see it, which might be a bear market that's going to turn bull. Like we're arguing right now, this downturn in T-bonds, forget it. When it turns up, it's going to be sharp and savage. Yeah. And we think we're getting close. It'd probably be coincident with gold. So we warn. Now we adjust our numbers in our weekly reports, so forth. Why? Because the moving averages, the means by which we're measuring our momentum readings, price versus the mean, change over time. Yep. Like if it's a weekly average, it changes every week. If it's a monthly, it might change every three months. If it's quarterly, it changes every quarter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we adjust our numbers and reissue reports, updating that particular market saying, okay, now the numbers change this month. If the NASDAQ 100 drops to this level, it's gonna break something. Uh, and next month, that number may adjust up. So we warn you, we show you the charts, and we adjust the trigger numbers so that when we break the trigger, you're fully intellectually ready to act or not act if you have an interest in that market. But we don't try to give you trades where we say, okay, buy it today and sell it three days from now. We're not mm -hmm. that kind of thing. We're more concerned about catching bigger trends. So it might be three or four months or three or four years before we say get out of this market because the trends have changed. So yep. it depends on the time scale of our analysis. Okay, awesome. I'm about coming to an hour, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but Mike, uh, also uh, for those people who want to find out more about you and what you do, where can they go? Oh, our website is www.oliver 
MSA for Momentum Structural Analysis, OliverMSA.com. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Michael. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.